I want to welcome everybody here this morning to Hope Christian Church Augusta. Uh, thank you, all those who are visiting. I want to welcome everybody in the parking lot and over in the other rooms. Uh, thank you for coming this morning. And surprise, for those of you who haven't or who regularly attend here, I'm not Dave. <laughs> Uh, and for those of you who don't normally attend here, I'm still not Dave. Um, but any, anyway, uh, to give a short introduction of who I am, some of you may know who I am. Uh, my name is Skyler. Uh, I am the son of Farron, or yeah, the son of Farron and Sonia Mary. Uh, most of you know my mom. She's the uh, head of children's ministry here. Um, so I pretty much grew up here my whole life. Was raised here, raised in this church, and um, after I graduated high school, went to college in Fairmont. <laughs> and uh, um, I was involved with uh, campus ministries there, Chi Alpha, it's great for Christ Ambassadors. It's not fraternity. I remember when I joined them, my mom was like, is that a good fraternity? I'm like, it's not fraternity, mom. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyhow, I, I served in a minor leadership role uh, there with Chi Alpha Campus Ministries in Fairmont. And uh, after I did two years of school and then got a job and moved to Pennsylvania. And eventually my career brought me back here uh, to Winchester. And here I am. So that's me. And uh, you're probably wondering why I'm up here. Uh, and I went to Dave probably about maybe a month ago now. And I told him, God, I've really been laying on my heart the concept of forgiveness and unity, especially with what's been going on in our nation the past couple of years. Uh, so before we go any further, I'm going to open this up with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and thank you for this time. We thank you for the freedom you grant us to worship freely in a free country. Lord, I pray uh, over this message this morning that, Lord, you speak through me and let it not be my own words, but let it be yours. Lord, I pray that uh, you just encourage us all, Holy Spirit, in our, all of our hearts and minds this morning that we may uh, uh gain something from this message and be able to carry it out through our daily lives, Lord. Lord, and help us always to remember what your son Jesus did for us. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Alright, so a pastor Dave Bradfield sermon always has an either really good or really bad joke to start off, right? And normally you don't really know whether it's good or bad to the end, so I guess you guys can be the judge of that. Um, and I'm actually stealing this one from him, so sorry Dave, I don't know if you had the copyright on that or not. Uh, but I'm changing around a little bit. Uh, and this, this, just disclaimer, it's, this, this is a made-up story, I promise. <laughs> uh, so my dad and I were working on somebody's gas service, and we had pretty much completed everything, you know, cleaned up, and, you know, we were ready to head back to the truck, and, you know, we're pretty competitive, right? So uh, my dad, me and my dad made a friendly wager, we were like, we're going to race to the truck, and whoever gets there first has to buy, or... Whoever wins, the other one has to buy a mountain dew and a piece of pizza for lunch, right? So we agreed, and we both took off, and I mean, my dad's an old man, so I pretty much figured I had him in the bag, right? So, uh, but I, we were running, I looked to my left, and there was a stranger running right next to me. And we got back to the truck, and uh, I was like, why, why are you running? And he, uh, he kind of looked at me, and he was like, well, if I saw two gas workers running, I figured I'd better run too, because something's about ready to blow up. <laughs> And uh, needless to say, uh, the boss heard about this incident, and uh, he wasn't very forgiving that we uh, scared a customer. So anyway, segue into forgiveness. <laughs> so anyway, uh, like I mentioned before, today's topic, uh, forgiveness and unity in a divided world. <clears throat> so, you know, there's a lot of reasons, you know, we as Christians should forgive others, uh, and we'll get kind of to the main point of that at the end, uh, but, you know, during this, this message here, you know, we're going to explore a couple different aspects of forgiveness and then tie it all in at the end. So, uh, we're going to start with the command to forgive. Uh, Matthew 18, 21 through 35, uh, if you all want to turn there with me, I have several passages. This, this is the longest one here. We're going to go ahead and uh, read this. Uh, so Matthew 18, 21 through 35. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him, up to seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to seventy times seven. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he had begun to settle him, one who owed him ten thousand talents was brought to him. 
But since he did not have the means to repay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, along with his wife and children and all that he had, and repayment to be made. So the slave fell to the ground and prostrated himself before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you everything. And the Lord of that slave felt compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. But the slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And he seized him and began to choke him, saying, Pay back what you owe. So his fellow slave fell to the ground and began to plead with him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you. But he was unwilling and went and threw him in prison until he should pay back what was owed. So when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved and came and reported to their Lord all that had happened. Then summoning him, his Lord said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? And his Lord moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed. My heavenly Father will also do the same to you if, you, if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. So, uh, I mean, here's a pretty good reason to forgive. Jesus told us to. <laughs> You know, he commanded us to do so. And for those of you who remember the show Duck Dynasty and, and the Robertsons, and uh, Willie Robertson once said, those words are red, so that means they're important. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's more than just that simple, right? To forgive, especially somebody who's wronged you. You know, the words 70 times 7 are probably one of the most unpopular, yet unpopular phrases in the Bible. And why is that? Because those... Those words are unpopular to preach and quote, or they're, they're popular to preach and quote, yet unpopular to carry out. In this world full of sin, there's a lot of wrong we can do to each other. And, you know, I can't stand here and pretend I know what everybody's going through today or what everybody has gone through. And, you know, in this screwed up crazy world, things can get really messy. You know, just to name a few of these so-called messy sins, if you want to call them that. Betrayal, murder, theft, rape, domestic violence. These can be pretty messy, as some people would probably say. And, you know, and these are just to name a few. And many of these can sometimes seem unforgivable. And some of you today sitting here may have gone through some of these things or other things. And are struggling to find a way to forgive others or even forgive yourself for the things, the truly awful things that you have done or have been done to you. And for some of those things, you know, like I said, I don't know what it feels like. And all I can really say is I'm truly sorry um, that those things have been done to you. I may not know what it feels like. And, uh, you know, I don't have a perfect answer for every situation. You know, maybe God is calling you to reconcile, or maybe God is calling you, you know, a different direction, you know, to forgive, but to go a different direction because the situation is physically, mentally, or spiritually dangerous to you. I, I can't give you that answer, but God can. And I'm here to tell you, number one, go to Him first, and number two, to forgive the people or person who's wronged you, or like I said, even yourself, forgive in your heart. Because that is what Jesus calls us to do. And, uh, you know, I know it's a lot easier said than done, but it's what we're called to do. And believe it or not, it may not seem like it, but it's actually the more peaceful and freeing path. And you're probably wondering why that is. Uh, you know, there's two reasons we're going to go into a little bit more depth here in a minute. Um, but number one, it's because, you know, as we read this, I think Jesus knew unforgiveness would tear us apart from the inside out. I mean, look at the forgiven slave who would forgive others. And the second reason uh, is because, you know, if we're going to call ourselves Christians, changed believers in the body of Christ are supposed to be an example for Jesus and imitate Him in all we do. Shouldn't we forgive others unconditionally in our heart since that is what Jesus did for us? 
And I, you know, and please don't think I'm not sitting here telling you we need to let ourselves get taken advantage of or let ourselves get put in a potentially dangerous situation or, you know, accept that the things wrong that were done to us are good. That's not what I'm saying by any means. Uh, because that be kind of foolish. You know, there's a difference between foolishness and forgiveness. The main thing I'm trying to say is we are supposed to forgive others unconditionally in our heart like Jesus did for us on the cross. So it's pretty hard, right? It's a pretty hard thing to do. Just got done telling you why we do it, because Jesus, one of the, one of the reasons why we do it, because Jesus told us to. But what does that look like? So uh, we're going to look at what it looks like to forgive through what Jesus did. And, you know, all of us know the story of Jesus going to the cross, dying on the cross, the forgiveness of our sins. And, uh, you know, that's... That's the main story we all turn to, but I actually want to turn to an occasion that is particularly known for the ultimate showcase of the forgiveness of Jesus. And that is when Jesus washed the disciples' feet. Uh, we're going to go to Mark 14, 27 and kind of set up what's happening when Jesus washes the disciples' feet. So if you want to turn there with me. So we're just going to read Mark 14, chapter 14, 20, verse 27. And Jesus said to them, You will all fall away because it is written, I will strike down the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered. So uh, to kind of set up what's going on here, uh, it's, it's the Last Supper. You know, the, the Passover, the last time Jesus was going to be doing such an event with all of his disciples. And, you know... I can't imagine, you know, because Jesus had all of the foreknowledge that Judas is going to betray him, his disciples are going to desert him, and he is going to die alone on the cross for the sacrifice of our sins. And Jesus quite literally tells his disciples all of this. So Jesus knows all of this is going to happen, and he tells his own disciples, his own friends, he tells them, gives them advanced knowledge, and he knows that despite giving them advanced knowledge of this, they are still going to forsake him anyway. But then Jesus washes their feet. So uh, let's turn to John 13, 5 through 7 to read about that. So John chapter 13, verses 5 through 7. Then he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. So he came to Simon Peter... And he said to him, Lord, or Peter said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I do you do not realize now, but you will understand hereafter. So, um, like I said, you know, we don't know exactly the the order of all these events, but based off of context, we know, you know, the Lord's Supper is going on. This is the last last Passover that Jesus will have with his disciples. And you know, they were more than just his disciples. They were his friends, his family. And he knew they were all forsaken. And what did he do after that? Did he curse them? Separate himself from them forever? Did he tell them off, start a riot, start a movement, start protests, go on a rant on social media, Facebook, Instagram, whatever? I don't think they had that back then. <laughs> he washed their feet. What an example of forgiveness through service. He knew everything that was about to happen, that nobody would be there for him. Put, put yourself in that position. You know, we get upset when somebody gets, you know, wrongs us, but he knew everybody was going to wrong him and abandon him. He knew that he would die an undeserved death for people who didn't deserve it. But he chose to forgive his disciples in that moment anyway. His friends in that moment practically became his enemies, and then he was given over to his enemies to die for his enemies. But he washed their feet. He showed them how to forgive 
by serving one another. Whose feet do you need to wash today? Who wronged you so bad that it is just pulling at you? It's hanging on your heart, your mind, your soul, your spirit. Wash their feet. Obviously, you know, you don't literally have to wash your feet, but I believe this is simply a metaphor to forgive them in your heart and serve them in that. And, you know, maybe simply just forgiving them in your heart is the best way you can serve them. Like I said, I don't, I don't know exactly uh, how you need to handle that situation. You have to pray and take that to God. And, you know, and that's okay if that's all you can do, because as I mentioned before, there's a lot of ways people get hurt. And maybe it's dangerous or toxic for you to revisit that person to offer, offer them your literal, literal words and actions of forgiveness. But I can tell you one thing. If you can do that, you should. And if you can't, like I said, I am pleading with you to forgive them in your heart. Because if you don't, it just leads to more pain. So we're kind of going to look now at, uh, at the, kind of the consequence of not forgiving, not forgiving or unforgiveness. So uh, like I just said, unforgiveness just leads to bitterness, leads to pain and suffering, which will affect all aspects of your life, whether you realize it or not. You know, remember my one point from earlier that I believe Jesus knew that Unforgiveness would tear us apart from the inside out. Remember the forgiven slave who wouldn't forgive. He threw his fellow slave in prison for not repaying his debts. And, but you know, with that said, I think I, I think I want to get us a, another example of how damaging unforgiveness can be. And uh, we got to go back a while. We're going to go to Jacob and Esau. And uh, but I think the fact that we got to go back a while kind of shows you that the world hasn't changed an awful lot, unfortunately. Um, we're not going to read the whole story, uh, but to set up for you what's happening here, many, many of you may know the story, and if not, I encourage you to go read it um, later on on your own. But Jacob and Esau were sons of Isaac, uh, who was the son of Abraham, and, and Esau was the oldest son, which meant he was supposed to get the blessing of his father. You know, and he was, based off of tradition, you know, he was supposed to get the best of the inheritance. Uh, but Jacob saw an opportunity. And Esau was a really weird, hairy man. For some, they, they, that's how they described him. So <laughs> Jacob dressed up as basically with a furry coat of an animal. <laughs> and it wasn't Halloween. It wasn't. Uh, but uh, Jacob dressed like his brother Esau to fool their father into giving him the blessing, not Esau. And, of course, Esau didn't like that very much. Uh, so let's read how he fell. Like I said, we're going back all the way to Genesis, uh, chapter 27, verses 41 through 45. <clears throat> so Esau bore grudge against Jacob because of the blessing with which his father had blessed him. And Esau said to himself, the days of mourning for my father are near, then I will kill my brother Jacob. Now when the words of her elder son Esau were reported to Rebekah, she sent and called her younger son Jacob and said to him, Behold, your brother Esau is consoling himself concerning you by planning to kill you. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice and arise. Flee to Haran to my brother Laban. Stay with him a few days until your brother's fury subsides. Until your brother's anger against you subsides and he forgets what you did to him, then I will send and get you from there. Why should I be bereaved of you both in one day? So it's pretty understandable that Esau would feel a little bit upset at what happened. You know, not saying it's right by any means. What Jacob did was wrong. Uh, but Esau's bitterness, his anger, his unforgiveness nearly drove him to the breaking point. The bitterness over his hurt took control of his heart, his mind, his body. In a sense, the unforgiveness took control of his entire life. 
Sound familiar? His vendetta for vengeance because of his unforgiveness took the place of God in his life. Church, this is sin. If it wasn't evident before when Jesus was saying it, I hope it is evident to you now. And, you know, granted, like everything else, if Jesus says it, you can't accept it, you probably won't be able to. But unforgiveness is a sin. And the reason unforgiveness isn't looked like as a sin is because it's convenient for it not to be to us. Because in our mind, they deserve it. They don't deserve to be forgiven for what they've done to us. But just look at what it did to Esau. His sole purpose for a short time was to destroy his brother, his own blood. Look what it did to his family, his friends, everyone around him. Relationships were practically ruined, all because he couldn't face his own unforgiveness. All of the drama, the hardship, the suffering that his unforgiveness caused. Church, you need to understand that just like with Esau, those things will happen if people in this world, especially Christians, choose not to forgive. It looks the same, it'll look the same way with us as it did with Esau. Families can get ruined. Relationships can get destroyed. Marriages fall. And the collateral damage of our own bitterness has a ripple effect that starts within our heart and continues outwards, affecting everyone and everything around us. Even when we think we are keeping a lid on it, you know, some people have better self-control than others, even when we think we're controlling it, the bitterness can still affect your attitude and behavior affecting others around you. And, you know, even if it's not noticeable, noticeable to you, it will. So who are you bitter against? Who can you not forgive? A co-worker? A friend? A family member? A classmate? A politician? Yourself? Maybe God. Unforgiveness is a slippery slope that just leads to despair, anger, and so much more. I wonder if we step back and looked at the big picture, if we'd see that the real pandemic is that the church cannot stand in unity because people can't forgive and lay down their own egos for the sake of unity in the church. Ironically, it, it took a while, but if you read on in Genesis, uh, and I encourage you all to do so, you would find how Esau ended up coming back to meet with Jacob uh, with a forgiving and giving attitude. Notice I said forgiving and giving. That goes back to the forgiving through service that we talked about when Jesus washed the disciples' feet. Esau offered, ser Esau offered uh, servants, belongings, and aid to Jacob. And, uh, you know, that's how, e that's how Esau was washing Jacob's feet. And honestly, Jacob was pretty guilt-ridden from what he had did, and he was pretty worried. And like I said, if you read it, we're not going to. Uh, but he didn't really know how to take Esau's forgiveness. Uh, so why, church, can't we do that? Why can't we be like Esau? Uh, granted, hopefully without the murderous rampage of right after. <laughs> Why can't we forgive and serve? For the unity of our families, our congregations, our churches, our relationships, our nation. <clears throat> this kind of leads me to my final point on the main reason about why we forgive. And the reason for forgiveness is for unity. Unity within the body of Christ and unity with Christ individually. And there's a really good picture of what that looks like. And we've got to go back to the first church. 
We're going to turn to Acts 2, 42, 47. This would be the part of Sunday school when I'd be like, does anybody want to read it? So Acts 2, 42 to 47. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe. And many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed, and, and all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling the property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. So who knew the best example of church was the first and original example of church? So I wonder, how far have we strayed from this? The early church was in unity together as the body of Christ. They were, they were in unity so well because they were willing to put aside everything from their belonging and yes, put aside their differences too because they knew they had the most important thing in common. And that was Christ. The early church was unified so well as the body of Christ because they knew how they were unified individually in Christ through the forgiveness of our sins done by Christ on the cross. So let's, let's break this down one last time. So from the beginning of time, since the very beginning, sin, because of sin, humanity became separated from God. We, we were separated. There was, there, was, there was no path back to God. I mean, in the Old Testament, they, they tried sacrifices, but it came down to the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins. And because of that, we've got a path back to our Creator, our Heavenly Father. We have been reconciled to God, to be in communion with God once more. No more separation from God because of what Jesus did. We as Christians boast so greatly about that Jesus died on the cross for our salvation so we can go to heaven for eternity. But we don't even realize what makes that gift so great isn't the location of heaven. This may be news to you, but what makes it the gift so great, it is the relationship with our heavenly Father in heaven. Heaven would be no different than the world outside our door if it wasn't for God. It's not as much about the destination of heaven it's about the God you, you will be with personally in the destination of heaven after a life of seeking and knowing Him spiritually on this earth. God has and will always want to know each of us individually on a spiritual level. And despite our shortcomings, He gave us a way to be unified with Him again. So with that said, church, why do we think anything will ever be any different if, if, if we don't forgive those around us? How can we ever look like the early church if we can't put aside our differences for the common commonality in Christ? I'm not saying ignore the evil in the world. 
But the only way to achieve that level of unity is to forgive those around us. So who do we need to forgive once again? Our brothers in Christ, our co-workers, our friends, family members, I guess our politicians. <laughs> our message, no matter what's going on with our nation's leaders, no matter what's going on down in D.C., no matter how evil they are or how evil they become, our message as a Christian to our offenders and our persecutors should be, we forgive you and we plead with you to repent and be reconciled to God. Just like Jesus did for us on the cross. Just like God achieved unity with us through the forgiveness of our sins by the blood of Jesus, we can achieve unity here on this earth by forgiving. Pride, anger, bitterness has never and will never get the job done when it comes to forgiveness. And such qualities... They have no place in the Christian's lifestyle. But what does get the job done when it comes to forgiveness is humility. It's about being humble. It's about knowing where our freedom really comes from. You know, over this past year, uh, I've seen it a lot with a lot of people. You know, we gird up our loins and we're like, these are my rights. I earned these rights. I deserve these rights. Whether it's masks or vaccines or guns or knives or whatever is next. These are my rights. And you can't take them from me because they're mine. Well, you might want to gird up your loins again because I'm about to give you a shot in the gut. Those rights... They were given by God. Don't get me wrong. I am very thankful for our servicemen and women who have fought for this country and those serving this country today. But God's will is God's will. If tomorrow he wanted us to lose all of these rights, then that's the way it go. Our rights, our freedoms are given. By God. Our freedom is not found at the foot of a star spangled red, white, and blue flag. Our freedom is found at the foot of the cross because of the blood of Jesus. We have to realize that, church. We have to realize that as a country. And the church has to lead that charge. <clears throat> you know, it, it has to become it has to become second nature, as hard as that may be to forgive people. Um, you know, most of you remember... Uh, Pastor James Ward, who used to preach here. And I remember at the end of his sermon, he always liked to, he used, to, he used to walk down uh, the stairs and kind of, you know, he wouldn't miss that opportunity. And, uh, and Dave does it as well. He doesn't walk down the stairs. Uh, well, sometimes he does. But, uh, <laughs> but he never missed that opportunity to let people know that the floor is open to give your life to Christ. He never missed that opportunity. And that always, you know, there was, there was a baseball player. I like the Baltimore Orioles, unfortunately. I should probably shouldn't admit that. Uh, but he, uh, there was this guy who played shortstop for the Baltimore Orioles for probably about six years or so. His name was J.J. Hardy. And uh, that man always ticked me off because he would never swing at the first pitch. That pitch would be right down the middle. And the pitchers knew it. They had the scouting report on him. They knew that he would not swing at the first pitch. And I watched years of J.J. Hardy playing for the Orioles, and he never swung at a first pitch, but maybe three times. 
And when he did, I was like, did, did he just did he just swing at the first pitch? Because he never did. He he was so disciplined that he was gonna make the pitcher give him a strike. And I, I mean, you know, I, that same determination was in James and Dave when they pleaded and cared about you guys, the people of this community, when they wanted to take every opportunity, discipline to take every opportunity to give your life to Christ. And we need to have that same discipline to be an example to others and forgive others. It's got to become a discipline of a second nature. <clears throat> so if the worship team wants to start coming forward, I think they kind of already have. Um, but I got, I wanted to end on this story uh, I heard on the radio, Caleb Radio Station this week, uh, they're doing their pledge drive, and I'll be honest, it bugs me sometimes, because like, I'm like, quit asking me for money, I want to hear my music. And uh, sometimes that bothers me, and that's something I need to get over. But there was a story that hit me really hard that they told. So... Uh, they told the story, the, the, this couple had called in and told this story, uh, this married couple, and uh, they were having issues with their marriage and, you know, it was kind of falling apart. And this band that they had, the radio was stuck on K-Love Christian Music, and he couldn't change the radio. He tried, it always made him so mad, but he could not get the radio station off of K-Love. And, you know, the wife prayed and, and hoped that it could maybe get through to him. Um, but can never change the radio station. And eventually their marriage kind of fell apart and they separated for a short period of time, unfortunately. Uh, but fortunately enough, later after that, they reconciled and came back together and uh, still had the van. And the van was still stuck on Caleb Radio Station. Uh, and then shortly after that, they sold the van to a neighbor and uh, they sold the van the next day. The neighbor was pulling out, or you know, pulling out or pulling in, blaring rock music. And the husband looked at the at the neighbor and was like, "Did how did you fix the radio?" And the neighbor was like, "I don't know. I just turned it on." <laughs> so shortly after that, the neighbor couldn't pay, so he gave the van back to this couple. And uh, eventually. Uh, the husband came to know Jesus and gave his life to the Lord. And they got this man back. And it was stuck again on Caleb Christian Radio Station. And he couldn't change the channel. And uh, eventually, like I said, he gave his life to the Lord. And uh, their marriage prospered. And eventually he couldn't take it anymore. He needed, to, he needed to get to the bottom of why he couldn't change the radio station. And uh, so he pulled the radio out of the van, and he pulled it apart, and he found one thin dot jammed into the radio. I think I have one, maybe. One thin dot jammed into the radio. Uh, this man, he didn't have a very good father figure in his life, and his father always told him he wasn't worth one thin dot. But to God, he was worth one ten dime. He was worth so much more. Church, no matter what gets done to us, no matter what gets done to you, the people who do wrong to you, your oppressors, they're worth more than one ten dime to God. They're still God's child whether it's President Joe Biden, Nancy Pelosi, Donald Trump, LeBron, LeBron James, Clayton Kershaw, fill in the blank, is God's child. No matter what. And you're worth much more than one ten dime to God too. No matter what anybody says or is done to you. And so if you're here today and you're 
don't know Jesus personally as your Lord and Savior, I encourage you to ponder that decision. Because like I said, it's, it's the more free, it's the peaceful path, knowing you have that hope in Jesus, that forgiveness of sins. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time.